Welcome to Sinful Horror Stories. If you're new to the channel, please be sure to subscribe now for future content and make sure you turn on the notifications so you don't miss a single video. Please make sure you leave a like on this video as it helps the YouTube algorithm perform at a much higher level. That way my channel will reach a far greater number of people. I appreciate all the love and support in the comments that you guys leave me. It honestly means the world to me. I will never quit making videos, and I will always try to provide the best horror content I can for all of you. If you want your story featured on an upcoming video, send it to thesinfulsavant at gmail.com. I will leave a link to my email in the description box below at the end. Sit back, relax, and stay sinful. I got up during the night to go to the camp toilet. It wasn't far away and I could see it from our tent. There wasn't anybody around. On my way back I spotted a man I didn't recognize shining a torch into the side of the boy's tent to make shadows appear. When he saw me approach he put his torch away and walked away but was sort of hovering around the campsite. I thought he was a campsite security and that I was going to get into trouble for leaving my tent during the night. And as I was an anxious kid, it kept me up all night long. As I couldn't sleep, I noticed for a good hour or so that the guy was still walking around and shining his torch into the side of people's tents. I could hear him and see the light. In the morning, I was falling asleep at breakfast, and my friends were taking the piss about it. One of the teachers noticed and thought I was getting sick, so she came over to ask if I was alright. I said I had been up all night because of the camp security guard shining his torch into tents. She looked horrified and said, What camp security? And went off to tell one of the male teachers. It turned out that the campsite didn't have security, and the police were called out. Some guy who was known to the area for being a sex offender had recently been released from prison and was living in the nearby forest in a tent. I was about 12 and I was at sleepaway camp. The counselors took us on a hike into the woods for the night. When it came time to go to bed, of course none of us were actually falling asleep. We overheard the counselors talking about the police looking for someone. We later learned one of the kids was in the middle of a serious custody battle and that the dad was planning on taking the kid and that the reason we were in the woods was so that he wouldn't find us at the cabin. No idea if it was actually dangerous, but looking back it definitely is unsettling. I went on a camping trip when I was a kid. One of the first ones out of the bus and I had to use the public bathroom. I noticed a few daddy long legs on the wall outside the bathroom. Think nothing of it. I open the door and am immediately greeted by thousands, if not millions of daddy long legs that are covering the bathroom from top to bottom. The bathroom was big as well, with at least three stalls and three urinals. That and coupled with the fact that our camp counselors were sadistic and told us pre-teens a bunch of scary stories, then jumped out of the woods in the middle of the night screaming with bloody Jason masks. I stayed in my tent most of the time after that. My youth group stayed at a campsite for a weekend trip. We were all in the cabin playing cards when someone with a gorilla suit ran by the cabin started banging on the door. It really freaked everyone out because it was no one in our group. They came back a couple of times until one of the adults confronted the person and they ran away into the night. They never found out who the person was in the gorilla suit. Let your minds wander for a second. How creepy is that? We were playing soccer and someone shattered my leg. Broke it in eight places. There was no swelling so they said I was faking it. And they wouldn't take me to the hospital. Instead they sent me back to my cabin for the night. I hopped around for a day but the next night I was in too much pain to sleep, so I limped to the nurse's office, broke in and took a handful of Benadryl just so I could sleep. 
That night, a group was doing an overnight in a three-sided shelter and decided to have a peanut butter fight before bed. One kid fell asleep with peanut butter in his hair and woke up when a skunk walked into the shelter and pulled a piece of the kid's scalp out. The kid punted the skunk out of the shelter, which caused it to spray everyone on the overnight. So they had to take the kid for a rabies shot, so they might as well take me along to get x-rays, since they were going anyway. Helen Keller could have pointed out the brakes on my x-rays. I was young, like 11 or 12 years old, and at a Girl Scouts camp. One night after lights out, we were told by our counselors to stay in the cabins, latch the doors, get under the beds, and turn out all of the lights. Some old guy had gotten drunk and trespassed. He had been walking around the property, but luckily didn't find any of the campgrounds. Rumors were, he had an axe, but I don't think that's true. Or at least I hope it's not. I went to a Boy Scout camp during the mid to late 90s. They had an archery range where we all were learning how to shoot. They were big on safety, but it was the 90s, so... Anyway, everyone shoots and we're going down range getting our arrows. Then we hear someone yell out in the covering shooting area. I look up and see the semi-special needs kid holding an arrow at full draw and let's go. The kid hits the kid standing five feet from me right in the arm. It's chaos. Everyone's running around and screaming. The kid with the arrow sticking out of him is just standing there in complete shock. Next year, there was no more archery training. We were on this really long canoe trip in northern Ontario, like deep wilderness. We were on this gorgeous clear lake when we found a secluded beach. It was very beautiful, so we decided to stay there for the night. The whole day and even sitting around the fire that night felt weird, but I couldn't really place my finger on it. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of soft country music playing. None of us had a stereo, so I stuck my head out of the tent to see what was up. There was a large bald man going through our campsite picking up stuff as he went along. We made eye contact and he put a finger to his lips and made a shh sound. So I hid in my sleeping bag the rest of the night. I was in a summer camp on an island when I was 13 and we were hanging out at a beach during dawn. All of a sudden a woman came out of nowhere, walked with big steps towards the water. She had been wearing a white cape which she threw dramatically away. Underneath, she was completely naked. When she reached the water, she walked into it, despite it not being very warm, until she started to swim. Always straight ahead, away from the island, until we lost track of her. We stayed for five more hours, but she never came back, and it was dark and she was naked. Her cape still lay on the beach. Back then we joked that she was a mermaid, but it later occurred to me that we may have witnessed a suicide. When I was 14 turning 15, I went to confirmation camp. This place was located literally in the middle of nowhere, just endless forest around us. There was a total of maybe 30 of us, teenagers as me and the camp leaders. The cottage was two floors high and on the second floor was a girl's bedrooms. We were settled down to sleep, it was probably around midnight, when suddenly there was a really loud banging on the only window the room had. Since it was already dark outside at this time, you really couldn't see what, or rather who, was until the person turned a flashlight on. The light was going through the room, and we were able to see two grown men probably around 30 years old, lurking on us and smiling. Thanks to whoever built this place, 
the window could not be opened and it wouldn't fit a person through it. The leaders of course heard the screams and voices and called the police, but the men had enough time to escape before the authorities arrived. In the morning while discussing the events of the past night, it turned out that one of the girls in the camp was actually having some kind of relationship with one of these men and had invited them in. The police did go and have a chat with these men, but they never got anything out of it, since I guess they didn't do anything too illegal. It was still very creepy to wake up to grown men looking at young girls while they were sleeping. I was 15 years old at a summer camp in upstate New York. One of the older counselors, maybe 22 years old, cornered me in a dark cleaning supply closet one afternoon. He started kissing me and grinded on me while grabbing my ass and pulling me into him. It lasted about 20 seconds, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. Another older male counselor had a bunch of nine-year-olds hold me down and grab me all over. It was terrifying. I went home after that summer a different person. I left home nine months later at the age of 16. It wasn't because of that specifically, but after being molested by my grandfather from age three to nine, and then a couple of guys in summer camp, I lost faith in my parents' ability to protect me. Every year I went to the same camp, and every year they tell us three things. Watch out for banana spiders, don't have sex, and don't attempt to dive down the lake. The lake in question has many caves at the bottom of it, probably 50 to 100 feet down. They used to teach scuba diving, but haven't since a counselor drowned. Nobody has scuba dived in that lake or attempted to reach the bottom for 15 years. The stories are passed on from counselor to counselor, and all is relatively the same. A group of kids didn't see their counselor, searched for him, came back up when oxygen got low, and alerted another counselor. Counselors went in the water to look for him, and people checked every inch of this camp in the middle of the woods. People were praying he wasn't in the water and somehow got out. Three hours later, his body was found, taken from the water. He was 22 years old and gone just like that. Camping in the backcountry can sometimes be an eerie experience, especially for those of us who spend more time in the city than in the woods. But what if you came home with proof that something out of this world and creepy happened? Writer Tammy Assers recounted a childhood event for Washington Trails. Family friends went camping deep in Canada's backcountry, and during the trip were plagued by unexplainable, deeply uneasy feelings. They went ahead and had dinner around the fire, and took pictures of each other sitting around and eating dinner. No one could explain why they felt so weird and jittery. That is, until they returned home and developed the rolls of film from their cameras. There, in the fire, they saw faces. They showed the pictures to Azar and other family members. Very clear faces coming up from the flames. To this day, I can remember the very evident eyes, noses and mouths of the phantoms that burned towards the sky. British backpacker Paul Onions was on the hiking trip of his life around Australia when he hitched a ride out of Sydney with a good-natured guy named Bill. An hour into the ride at the entrance to a state forest, Bill turned into a monster, stopping the car and pulling a gun on Paul, then producing a rope to try and tie him up. Paul ran for his life with Bill chasing after him, managed to convince a passing driver to stop jumping into the back seat and telling the driver to get out of there. He called the police to report the assault, but for some reason the report went unnoticed for four years. When detectives finally investigated, the details that Paul and the woman who had saved him gave them helped them lead to Bill, whose real name was Ivan Malat. 
one of Australia's worst serial killers, who had murdered several backpackers in that same part of Belangelo State Forest. Most hikers don't worry too much about hearing footsteps nearby, since most popular trails these days will have more than one person on them. But when those footsteps sound near you for days, that's a little more creepy. It happened to a hiker in the Arizona backcountry who was on a multi-day hike through a canyon, according to Washington Trail's Azers. When the hiker walked, he heard footsteps. When he stopped, the footsteps stopped. He thought the footsteps were an echo of his own, but sometimes they would speed up and get very loud. After four days of this, he decided to cut his hike short and go out of the canyon by a different trail. The footsteps followed him nearly all the way to his car, outside of the canyon. Thank you guys for watching and listening to the very end. Please make sure to subscribe if you like what you heard during this video. Please be sure to leave a like as well. And if you want your true scary story featured on an upcoming video, email my email in the description box below. Till we meet again, stay safe, stay sinful. So I was 26 at the time and also I'm a lady. I needed gas and it was around 11pm on a Saturday. I pulled into a busy gas station to fill my tank up, except it was completely bare, not a car in sight. I also live in Alaska and it was very cold this night, maybe negative 10 I guess. But I was tired after working and just wanting to get home. Usually I start my pump and sit in my car due to the freezing cold, but this time I had a weird feeling that I just needed to stand by the pump, so I did. I just started pumping my gas when a little gold sedan pulled up right next to me. A guy got out and I was feeling hypervigilant for some reason. He started cleaning his completely clean windows and as he put back the squeegee he started towards me. I felt like I wanted to run but I stayed calm and continued pumping. He asked me if I would help him put his windshield wiper fluid in his car because he ran out and he doesn't know how to open the hood. I laughed it off and told him that I don't know either which was actually a lie. But he kept getting closer and closer to me while trying to lure me to his car by saying that there's something under his seat that he can't reach because he's too big. Now, I'm 5'2 and petite. This man was large and scruffy. I think Alaska wilderness dude. And at this point, I'm freaking out and I hit the sell button on the pump. He took a step back and started to go back to his car and I thought that I was being smart. My gas is almost done. I looked into his car when I noticed that the insides of the doors... They had no handles, except for the driver door, and that really freaked me out. I was putting the pump back and opening my door. He was right behind me, slammed my door shut, and yelled, You're coming with me. Obviously, I refused, and I was petrified. He grabbed my arm and slammed me against my car, and I elbowed him as hard as I could. I started to scream at the top of my lungs, and thank God for the gas attendant with a big gun that night, because... If not for him, I don't know what would have happened to me. The attendant pulled the video and we made a police report. I called immediately after that guy took off and I never heard anything else about it after that night. And I guess the best that I can hope for is that he didn't get some other girl alone like I was. So my girlfriend has a younger sister who unfortunately has cerebral palsy and autism too. And although she's very smart, she can't really support herself fully and will probably need help and guidance for the rest of her life, which is perfectly fine. She's basically our adopted daughter. My girlfriend taught her sister how to walk and talk and basically everything that she knows. But one day, my girlfriend told me how there were three instances in her life where her sister basically sort of broke character and told her how she was stuck and couldn't get out. 
and that she was trapped and needed help desperately. Her sister talks in a very sort of specific kiddish and cutesy way. She's very innocent and to this day, at 19 years old, talks to her stuffed animals like as if they're real. But during the three times where she broke character, my girlfriend told me that her sister spoke in a certain desperate and adult tone and made a face like she was scared for her life and literally the next second her face would change and she would go back to the way that she was before. And my girlfriend told me that it would be like her sister didn't remember what had just happened moments ago. To this day, it scares her and makes her wonder what if her sister is trapped in a, a childlike state and sometimes has moments of like clarity or something. I'm not sure, but when she told me, I could tell that it was serious and she's never brought it up ever since because of how much it creeps her out. Sometimes I get worried that one day she might break character with me and only I'll be around and I won't know what to do. She's very sweet and we love her just the way that she is, but it really creeps me out to think that, I mean, what if her mind was being held hostage by another? G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Chime a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, have you ever received an overdraft fee unexpectedly? I know I have, and it really felt like I was being taken advantage of. I hate how this happens when you least expect it too, like when you're just withdrawing some cash that you expect to be in your account because you should be paid your week's wage by that point, only to find out that you haven't been paid yet, and so you've overdrawn. I've been there and it really felt like I was scammed out of my hard-earned dollars. Well, kick off 2022 with a better checking account, with no monthly fees. Chime, an award-winning app and debit card, has no overdraft fees, foreign transaction fees, monthly fees, or even service fees. With over 60,000 fee-free in-network ATMs at many locations like most Walgreens, 7-Eleven, CVS, you can access your money when you need it, where you need it. You can also send money to anyone, even if they aren't on Chime. Fee-free for you and no cash-out fees for them. Make your first good decision of the new year and join over 10 million people using Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at chime.com forward slash be scared. That's chime.com forward slash be scared. And in the spirit of transparency, just know that banking services are provided by and debit cards are issued by the Bancor Bank or Stride Bank, NA, members FDIC. Get fee-free transactions at any MoneyPass ATM in a 7-Eleven location and at any Allpoint or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. Otherwise, out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Also, sometimes pay anyone instant transfers can be delayed, and the recipient must use a valid debit card or be a Chime member to claim funds. For as long as I've known my wife, she's mentioned growing up in a haunted house. I always assumed that she was just joking because she always brought it up in a, a quite light-hearted way, I guess, and never went into much detail. It was a big old house, and I figured that she was just talking about weird old house noises. But the house belonged to her great-aunt, who raised my wife for most of her childhood. Her great-aunt recently passed away, and her great-aunt's daughter, who my wife calls her aunt, though technically she's her second cousin or something, I'll be referring to her as her aunt though, now owns this house. After my wife's great aunt passed though, we went to stay in the house for four nights to attend the funeral and spend time with my wife's family, as we live in another state. When we got there, my wife and her aunt were chatting and mentioned that they thought that my wife's great aunt might join the ghosts already haunting this house. And to be honest, I still hadn't considered that they might actually be serious. The first night that we spent there, I woke up in the middle of the night and noticed something standing in the corner of the room beside the door. Thinking that it was my wife, I asked what she was doing, and this woke my actual wife up, who was actually sleeping beside me. I said that I thought that I saw someone in the room with us, but it must just be my eyes playing tricks on me. She then said, the person in the corner next to the door... Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. I almost wet myself. 
I thought that there was some creep in my room to be honest and my wife was just too sleepy to process it. So I grabbed my phone to call the police but when my phone lit up the room I saw that there was nobody there anymore. There wasn't even a weird shape that I might have mistaken for a person. The door was closed so it wasn't like there could have been someone there who left the room in the moments that I was looking away to grab my phone. My wife told me that it was common to see shadowy people in the night, but I shouldn't worry because they don't do anything apparently. She fell back asleep right after that, but I just laid there awake the whole night, wondering what the heck had just happened. The next morning, I asked my wife about it, and she said that she wasn't kidding about the house being haunted. People who spend the night in the house regularly see and hear ghosts, but... They've never heard anyone or caused any problems, apparently. I remained skeptical even after the next night, which had been after the funeral, and my wife and aunt both reported that they'd been visited in their dreams by my wife's great aunt. So far in my mind, everything was weird but explainable, I guess. That the figure in the room could have been a strange trick of the light. My wife and her aunt had just attended the funeral of their loved one and it made sense for them to both dream about her that night. But maybe it was a coping mechanism. But the third night, I was kept awake for hours by the constant sound of footsteps pacing around the house. And my wife also heard them but said that it was normal and I shouldn't worry and she fell asleep easily. A few times during the night, I got up to look around for the source of the noise. I even did a, a couple of laps of the outside of the house in case there was somebody outside, but I never saw anyone walking around. At one point, I was in the lounge room and heard footsteps from the kitchen and called out to ask if there was anybody there. My wife's aunt opened her bedroom door and said that she could hear the footsteps too. And just like my wife, she told me that it was normal and... There was no cause for concern. Then there was the sound of a drawer opening in the kitchen, which we both reacted to and I went to check it and found the cutlery drawer open. My wife's aunt, who had come to the kitchen too, simply closed the drawer, commented with mild annoyance that the ghosts are always leaving things open and went back to bed, leaving me to my own existential crisis. I just could not come up with a way to explain that away. We both heard the footsteps, both heard the drawer open at the same time, and there was nobody there and no way out of the kitchen except for past us. I tried staying on the couch to try and catch this mystery walker, and there were multiple times that I heard the footsteps pass through the lounge room, but I never saw anything. Eventually, I just gave up and I went back to bed, Nothing really happened the final night, though we did wake up to several cabinets open and nobody remembered leaving them open, though that could be explained by somebody just forgetting I guess or even sleepwalking. Even so, the footsteps, they still bothered me and the shadowy person from the first night and the cabinets opened on the final night made me nervous in light of everything that happened on the third night. Up until now, I've always scoffed at the idea of the paranormal, but... I just can't reconcile my experiences in that house with my skepticism. Talking to my wife's family revealed that everyone who stayed in that house believes that it's haunted because they've had at least one completely unexplainable experience there. They all report that the ghosts leave people alone for the most part, though some who have lived there for a long time as children, including my wife and her aunt, have described meeting people that they thought were probably ghosts and have positive but strange interactions with them. To be quite honest as well, I'm still not sure what to think about it.